Take away the dark of night. Fill me with your pure delight. Touch me with your hand. God of grace, flow into this holy place. Listen as your children pray. Take me as I am, healer of my heart, lover of my soul, maker of the stars, the earth, the sky. Come and make me whole, savior of this world. Praises you alone, healer of my heart, lover of my soul. Emmanuel, lead me to the deepest well, where never-ending love. Praise the Lord, God's children, because this is a day that the the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. <clears throat> you know, I have to apologize. We've had a little technical difficulty getting on the air this morning, but we're here. And I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie, and welcome to um, the Master's Touch Healing Service. You know, my friends, we're delighted to be able to bring these healing services to you to glorify God and heal His children. But right now, let me ask you something. I would like to ask you if you came expecting to receive from God today. Because, you know, my prayer for you is that you do receive your healing touch from God. But let me say this. If you don't come expecting to receive, you won't. So raise that expectation level. Expect to receive. And you know what? You will. Now take a second right now to assemble a small piece of bread, a cracker, some sort of a bite of food, uh, some a swallow of a beverage, juice, whatever. Uh, it can be water. Set it aside. We're going to pray over it and sanctify it as the body and the blood of Christ a little later on. Now, so that you know for future reference, these are known as the elements of the covenant, and this is what I'll be asking you to bring forth later on in the program. You know, my friends, it's imperative that we usher in the Holy Spirit by invitation. How do we do that? Through praise and worship. Now, the, bell, the Bible tells us that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people, so we're going to do just that. We're going to praise him. And if you don't know these songs, listen to the words. Let them minister to you, allowing the Holy Spirit to join you as we worship and sing. Savior, let him be your friend, one who will accompany 
company and cleanse. Our God specializes in good things, things that you and I really need. Good things for the body and spirit. All you have to do is just believe. Specializes in good things, things that you and I really need. Good things for the body, good things for the body and spirit. All you have to do, all you have to do is just believe. Good things, good, good things. All you have to do is just believe.
Now stop what you're doing, pull up a chair, and get ready to receive. We have entered God's presence with praise and thanksgiving, and now as we dwell in His presence, embrace the sweetness of the Holy Spirit, bask in His presence, and open your hearts to receive Him. You're my beloved, you're my bride To sing over you is my delight Come away with me, my love Under my mercy Heavenly Father, we come into your presence in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, and they're open wide to receive your healing power. With our love and our devotion, just free-flowing from our lips and our hearts. We love you and adore you, and we praise your precious holy name. Lord, we magnify you. We thank and praise you that we dwell in the secret place of the Most High, and we thank you that you've already heard our prayers. We rejoice because your word tells us that all of your answers for the believer's prayers are yes and amen in Christ. Now we thank you for the gifts of utterance, Lord, the rhema word of God, the logos word of God, and all revelation, knowledge, and impartation. We thank you that the healing power for God and of God is here for all. It's present right now for all to heal. We give you thanks and praise for sending your only begotten son to save us and take all sickness and disease from us. And we thank you that we are healed, made whole, and completely restored. And we give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In the name above all names, 
the matchless name of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. You know, my friends, the power for healing always follows the Word of God. Now, that's exactly where we're going next, deep into the Word of God. So you have to participate. We can't expect God to simply do everything for us. We have to get involved. So far, we've come into His presence, and now we're going to soak in worship. And as we do, I want you to let God hear you speak to His heart. As we prepare for His Word, open up your minds and hearts, expecting to receive.
Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be wholly acceptable to you. Let my words be your words and your words be mine. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, for many years now, I've been asking this question, do you know and understand that God can heal you? Well, do you know and understand that he will heal you? Then I follow those questions by telling people that they don't have to be sick. Why? Because God wants to heal you, folks. You see that all over his word. And the most difficult thing about understanding that is that you have to have faith in order to have him heal you. So does that sound more difficult than you can accept? Well, it's true. You see, the key to receiving your healing from God is to have faith. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus often said to those that he healed, your faith has healed you. However, Matthew 13, verse 58 says, and Jesus did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. So lack of faith can stop God's healing power. Well, if lack of faith, doubt, can stop God's healing power, then faith releases God's healing power. So what we need then is faith. Now, <clears throat> when, well, how do we get it? How do we get that faith? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans 10, verse 17, that faith comes from hearing God's word. So it's vitally important then that we understand what God's word says about divine healing, wouldn't you say? Do you reject God's healing power because of his word and you're rejecting his word? Well, that's what happens. If you don't accept God's word and accept him at his word, then you're rejecting his word and you're rejecting his healing power. You know, it's heartbreaking and it's unfortunate, but there's very, very many Bible-believing Christians out there that reject what God says about his healing power. Most of the time, they don't even know they're doing it. Now, the rejection is based primarily on two things, because some people don't get healed when they pray or because of traditional teaching. You know, people are stuck in the rut of their past knowledge of God and, and his moves. But here's the point. No one has ever rejected God's healing power based solely on the word of God. Because anyone with an open mind and an open Bible will become a believer in God's healing power. You know, it's clear from what the Bible tells us that Jesus healed and he healed often. Did you know that two-thirds of his ministry was healing and restoration? That's right. Jesus' main ministry consisted of three things. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Our evidence is found in Matthew 4, verse 23. So we can plainly see that healing was not a side issue with Christ. It was a main issue with him. Here's the question. Does Jesus still heal today? Well, according to Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah! Jesus still heals today. Praise God! You know, the Word of God tells us in Matthew 12, verse 15, that many followed Jesus, and he healed all their sick. Jesus healed all, not some or most folks, all. So you know what? I had to prove it. I looked up the word all in the Greek, and all means all. <laughs> so praise his name. <laughs> you know, it's God's will to heal every believer. Nowhere in the scriptures do we find that Jesus refused to heal anyone who came to him in faith. He healed everyone who believed without exception, and I've seen it over and over and over again. It happens all the time. And here's the crux of the issue. If you don't believe something, you won't receive it. How can I say that? Because you reject it. If you do believe in it or believe something, then, then you have faith in it. So what do you do? You receive it. What happens then? It manifests for you. Well, yeah, but will it manifest instantly? It can, but most often if it has to do with healing, uh, it's a progressive thing. It takes a process and, and it takes some time. Restoration, on the other hand, is instantaneous. Now, keep in mind that there will come a time in every believer's walk when their faith gets kind of wobbly. And what I mean by that is that they're limited in their ability to stand in faith to the degree, uh, to the degree that it takes to overcome that horrible situation that seems to be looming over them like a wave of a tsunami. So what do you do when that happens? Well, it's then that you have to realize that it isn't your faith that you need to stand on. You see, we stand on the faith of God, the faith of Jesus Christ. So ask yourself these questions when you're faced with that horrible kind of situation. Does God have the faith to manifest my miracle? Yes. He's my creator. Of course he has the faith. Well, does Jesus have the faith to manifest my miracle? Yes. He's my redeemer. Look what he did for me at the cross. He definitely has the faith. Now, when you realize, I mean, really get a hold of the fact that God and Jesus are one entity and that they do individually and collectively have that faith, that it's their faith you stand on, my friends, not your own. You see, your faith 
and my faith, all of our faith, is limited by the level of understanding of God's Word that we're on. To break free of those limitations, reach out for God's faith and stand on that. When you do, uh, what, what you're standing in faith for will manifest, and you'll automatically move into God's rest. Now, friends, I want you to pay close attention to this. Not only did Jesus heal everyone while he was here on this earth, but to ensure our healing for today, he paid for it. Isaiah 53, 4 tells us, Surely Jesus took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. So, there you have it. Jesus took up your infirmities, your sickness and diseases. He took them, and since he has already taken them, guess what? You don't have to have them. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Now, this scripture should really settle any issue on divine healing, and yet some people seem to argue with God. They want to, It seems like they want to fight for their right to keep the sicknesses that they have. Some try to re find reasons why that scripture doesn't mean what it says. I've had a lot of folks say to me, this scripture is speaking about spiritual healing, not physical healing. Here's my answer to that. I don't see the word spiritual in the verse, so you're adding to the Bible. Let's let Matthew tell us what God meant as spoken by the prophet Isaiah. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to Jesus, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. Matthew 8, verses 16 through 17. So, it's clear from Matthew that he interpreted the words from Isaiah to mean physical healing, since he quoted it in reference to the healing ministry of Jesus. Now, another good reason that we should have faith for healing is this. Sickness is darkness, and it's of the devil. Look at the word devil, cross out the D. What do you see? Evil. That's right. Sickness is evil, folks. It comes from the evil one. It's of the devil, and whatever is of the devil, we don't want anything to do with. Amen? Listen to Acts 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. Then Luke 13, verse 16 tells us that after healing a woman who was crippled by a spirit, Jesus said this, should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free? Now, from these scriptures alone, and there are many, many others, we are, uh, well, we can clearly see that sickness is not caused by God, but by Satan. And God tells us in James 4, verse 7, to resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, I know I'm making this sound simple. It is. Kind of offhand. I'm saying, like, well, you're not sick. And yet, there you are, with symptoms of dire sickness, and some are in pain, and in many cases, the condition is life-threatening. However, you need to get this into your heart and your mind. We don't have to put up with anything that comes from the devil. That includes sickness and disease, lack, poverty, anything at all. Are you listening to me? Satan's a thief, and he's trying to steal your health, he's trying to steal your position with God, and he's trying to steal your healing from you. I want you to see who's making you and your loved ones sick. It's the devil, not God. So the bottom line then is this, what do you believe? And when we're finished here today, what will you believe? Go with me to Matthew 9, verses 28 and 29. The blind men came to Jesus and asked him to heal them. And Jesus asked them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, will it be done to you? Listen, my friends, God will do for you according to your faith, according to what you believe. What do you believe? If you believe Jesus still heals and that it's his will to heal everyone, including you, if you believe that he paid the price for your healing, if you believe that sickness is of the devil and that you have authority over him, oh, by the way, you do, then you've begun your faith journey to walk in divine health. So don't tolerate sickness. You have a divine bill of rights, my friends, from receiving answers to prayer to raising the dead. God has set aside for you a wonderful inheritance. And included in this inheritance is right to good health. God made sure of your spiritual birthright through Jesus. Like him, you have a right to prosper in your physical body. And the Bible refers to you as a joint heir or equal beneficiary with Jesus. Found in Romans 8 verse 17. Although Jesus is the Son of God, he came to earth as the Son of Man, born like any other human being. His purpose was to show us the Father, and once gathering us into himself, show us how to live supernaturally like superhuman beings in this natural world. Think about it. As a man, flesh and blood, Jesus possessed the power to heal the sick, lay hands on the lepers, correct blood disorders, manifest new body parts, open blind eyes, cast out demons, and raise the dead. What do you think his attitude towards sickness and disease was? He didn't tolerate it, and neither should you. 
Jesus was inheritance-minded, and inheritance-minded people are completely confident in the integrity of God's Word. In simple terms, they not only believe in God, they actually believe God. Jesus' attitude toward sickness was the result of his study of the Scriptures. He knew with absolute certainty he had every right to exercise his God-given authority in this, law, in this earth. You know, Luke 4, verse 18 tells us of Jesus' confidence in who he was, what was available to him, and what he was capable of doing. Jesus said, I am empowered by the Holy Spirit to heal, deliver, and set free those who are poor of, of health and in bondage. Let me ask you this. What's your attitude towards sickness? Do you accept it as a way of life? You know, many believers, well, actually most believers, settle for less than God's best where their health is concerned. Some have even accepted the satanic lie that God will put sickness on you to teach you a lesson. Now that's a lie right out of the pit of hell. How do we know? Because Deuteronomy 7 verse 15 tells us that the Lord will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt. Think about it. What lesson could you possibly learn from getting cancer? Heart disease, kidney or liver disease, diabetes, or even the common cold. Come on, listen. Would you, as a parent, give your child a disease, make him or her sick to teach them a lesson? No. Then what makes you think your Creator, who is love, would do that to you? There's no lesson to be learned from sickness and disease. My friends, you have the right to divine health, and it starts with changing the way you think and speak. Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And Proverbs 18, verse 21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> it means that if you're sickness-minded and you go around saying, I'm so sick, it looks like I'll never get over this. Or if you're one of those who continually rehearses the symptoms when somebody asks you how you are today, then that's exactly what's going to happen, says Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Be like Jesus. Take a firm stand against sickness. He's already paid the ultimate price for your healing. Supernatural health is yours, my friends. God wants you healed. He wants you made whole and well, and he wants you completely restored. Now, I'm sharing with you today some things in God's Word that apply to receiving your healing and maintaining your healing. I'm also going to share some things with you that you may find hard to believe, but you know what? They're in the Word of God for all of us to benefit from. So let's begin, first and foremost, with this. Because of Jesus' finished work at the cross, you were healed at the cross. Now, in the book of Isaiah, it tells us, Surely he took my sickness and carried my pains. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. You see, Jesus took our place and took the punishment for all of our sin, all of our broken covenant and rebellion, and this included sickness and disease. He took it. He paid the price and took it specifically when he was tied to that post and was being beaten. You know, people could see the soldiers beating him, but what they couldn't see were the blows that God was beating him with. While that beating was happening to his body in the natural realm, in the spirit realm, he was being beaten by God. Make a note of this. Jesus took all sickness, disease, and sin in his body, not in his spirit. His spirit was untouched. Now the prophet Isaiah in chapter 53 verse 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, God, hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. By his bruise we are healed. Well, was it the bruises that the Romans put on him? No, it says that it pleased the Lord. You know, God's not mean, folks, so why would it please the Lord to bruise him? Because he who knows the end from the beginning, my friends, could see your face and mine. Yes, but he was bearing our sins. That's right, but not in this verse. This verse says he was taking our sicknesses and carrying our pains. Look, Young's literal translation says Jehovah has delighted to bruise him. He has made him sick. And another translation says it pleased the Lord, with, uh, the Lord to crush him with disease. You know, the beating Jesus took was horrific. Then being nailed to a cross is beyond comprehension. But that really wasn't just, that wasn't even half of it. That was just a very small part of what happened to him. What made him sweat drops of blood in Gethsemane? What made him ask God to let this cup pass? Understand this, my friends, Jesus is not weak. Oh, no. Jesus is strong, yet he fell on the ground, overcome with all the pressure of it. Why? 
because in a few hours, while he was hanging on the cross, all the evil, the vile ugliness of all the iniquity and sin of all of mankind, from Adam all the way into the future and right down to the very last man on earth, will converge on him. Now, he isn't going to just empathize with it. Oh, no, my friends, he's going to become it. Then, added to all of that, God will turn away from him. That's why he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The full judgment of God for all of mankind's sin and all their broken covenant and rebellion has come upon him. Before Jesus went to the cross, he was tied to the scourging post, beaten senseless like a criminal, and the Bible says that Isaiah, seeing it in the Spirit centuries before it ever happened, said what? God is bruising him. God is beating him. You see, with each blow, God struck him with the spiritual root of every sickness and disease that mankind will ever know. That will ever know. Jesus took that for you. So why should you have to pay for it again? After all, that's why Jesus is at the cross, taking your beatings, sin, sickness, and disease. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. You know, the Bible tells us that during all the trial of Jesus, during all the time he was being beaten, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Acts 22. Here they tied the man of God to the scourging post, just as they did with Jesus. Actually, it hadn't been that long after they had crucified Jesus, and as they are tying him to the post, I want you to get this, he opens up his mouth and says... I want you to totally get the picture. They took off his coat, tied him to the post. He could hear that guy warming up his whip behind him in the background. And Paul says, hey, hey. And the scourger yells, shut up. You're about to be beaten. But Paul shouts, hey, is it legal to beat a Roman citizen that hasn't been found guilty and convicted of a crime? Is it legal? Now, he knew it wasn't legal, and they knew it wasn't legal. But here's the thing. He opened up his mouth. Why? Because he knew about his rights. You see, in those days, if you weren't a Roman citizen, you were no one. You were absolutely nothing. It makes no difference who you are, what you have. Non-citizens could be beaten and made slaves, but not Roman citizens. If you were a Roman citizen, you were someone. You had rights, and you had rights that the whole kingdom and the emperor himself backed up personally. Because you had rights, you could appeal your case all the way up to Caesar. Actually, Paul did. The Bible tells us that he stood before Agrippa and said, I appeal to Caesar. Now, Paul's a Roman citizen. He can appeal to Caesar. Why? Because he had rights. You know, we have rights, too, as citizens of the United States of America. They're listed in our Bill of Rights and our Constitution. Okay, why is this in the Bible? But more importantly, why am I talking about that in a healing message? Well, the Bible says in Philippians 3, verse 20, that our citizenship is in heaven. That means that your name is written in a book, the Lamb's Book of Life. You see, in eternity, if you aren't a citizen of heaven, no matter who you are, who your family is, how important you are or think you are, you aren't anyone. There's only one thing that matters, my friends. If your name isn't in that book, if you aren't a citizen of heaven, nothing else matters. But here's the good news. If your name is in that book, you have heavenly citizenship, and you have rights. Now, you have those rights not when you get to heaven. Oh, no, you have those rights right now. Now, most citizens, uh, Christians, I mean, <laughs> heavenly citizens, most Christians don't know this. So they're silent. They take the stealing of their finances. They take the sickness and disease that tries to come on them and their children. They take it, and 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 the devil is stealing from them and beating them, and they're taking it. Why? Because they don't know they have any rights. So they don't stand up for themselves or speak up for themselves. You know, look, what if Paul had been quiet? I mean, what if he just sat there and said, well, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes, and I guess I do deserve a good beating. Lord, help me to be strong and take this like a man. Well, if that's all you know, then the Lord will give you strength. But I'm here to tell you that there's something much, much better. Now, what did Paul say? He said, wait a minute. He opened up his mouth and said, wait just a minute. That guy with the whip is cracking it, anxious to get on with the program. He's just waiting for someone to whip and torture. He's going to flay him. He's going to flay you. So what do you say? Hey, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. That's right. You tell that devil this. It is not lawful. 
The devil doesn't want you to know this. He's a spiritual outlaw. He wants to take advantage of your ignorance. Now, he wants you to be quiet and take it. Paul says, is it lawful for you to whip a Roman citizen? Why? Because he knew who he was and he knew he had rights. Look, when the centurion heard Paul's protest, he stopped the whole thing. So, the low-level devil comes to you. And what do you do? You open up your mouth and speak up, my friend. You tell him, no, not in my body. You're not giving me this sickness, this disease. Speak it out. Tell him it's not legal. Listen, when you're born again, you become a citizen of heaven, and the devil no longer has any influence over you at all. You see, you are born into the citizenship of the heavens when you accept Jesus as your Savior, and your name then is written in a book. That book is the book of the redeemed, a roster of the citizenship of the eternal kingdom of God. And now, as a citizen, you have rights, and you have to know those rights and speak them out loud. Jesus didn't open his mouth. If he had, legions of angels would have saved him. He could have. When they tied him to the post and beat him, during which time the hand of God was striking him with the core cause of every sickness and disease mankind's ever going to know, he could have said, I appeal to justice. I'm innocent. I appeal to God Almighty. If he had, he would have been saved, and we would have to pay the price for our sins. But he didn't. All he had to do was open his mouth and speak, but he didn't. He was silent. The Bible says he opened not his mouth. He took it. Why didn't he open his mouth? He was silent so that we could open up our mouths. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Open up your mouth and say when anything negative comes and begins pounding on you. Don't keep silent. Open up your mouth and say, it's not legal. Tell the devil, it's not legal for you to touch me. I am a citizen of heaven. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. You speak up and the enemy will flee. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Open up your mouth and declare that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Praise God for this information, my friends. Praise God for our rights and heavenly citizenship. Hallelujah. Glory, glory to God. Now, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says this, As he is, so are we in this world. The he that that scripture is referring to is Jesus. So let's put his name there. As Jesus is, so are we in this world. Not only are you where Jesus Christ is, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, but you are also as Jesus Christ is. Okay, how is he? Full of perfection and life. His health is the vibrancy of his life. While he was here on this earth, he was never sick. He didn't have so much as a headache or a hangnail. So why couldn't we walk in that same vibrant health? We can, because of the profound union we have with Jesus through our faith. Remember, when he found us, we were sinners and separated from God because of our sin. But now, we believers are in union with Jesus Christ, us in him and he in us, through our faith. And we're something completely new and different. The Bible tells us in Genesis 2, chapter 20, chapter 2, cha verse 23, I'll get it. Uh, Genesis 2, 23, about God taking a rib from Adam and creating Eve. And Adam said this, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Well, you need to understand this. When we're born again, we are born out of, through Jesus Christ. And we are now, as born again believers, bone of Jesus' bone and flesh of Jesus' flesh. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. We now have Jesus' DNA. We are born of him spiritually and physically restored to his supernatural health and wholeness. So watch this now. If Jesus is in us and we're in him, then all of his vibrancy of life, all of his attributes, all of his wholeness and divine health are in us as well. When we're born again, we, like a caterpillar, make a great exchange, my friends. The caterpillar goes into a chrysalis and a supernatural exchange happens. What happens? He comes out a butterfly. He remains a butterfly for the rest of his life. He can never go back to being a caterpillar. He will forever remain a butterfly. Now, when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, a supernatural exchange takes place. Ready? In the twinkling of an eye, we move into Christ. However, we never come out of him. We remain in Christ for all eternity. Jesus is in us, and we are in him. Therefore, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. So when symptoms come knocking, and you know they're going to because the enemy doesn't want you to know that it's illegal for him to touch you, speak it out loud. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. You know, it's imperative that you understand this. 
When Jesus was crucified and afterward went to hell, he destroyed Satan. He took the keys to hell and conquered sin and death. And he defeated the devil, took back the dominion and authority, the empowerment of God that was given to Adam and Eve and restored it back to who? Us. He restored us to the blessing, that empowerment. Now, when Jesus was on the earth, the Roman army would vanquish their foe. And when then they would like strip their leaders and captives down to nothing, nakedness. And then tie them together, single file. Then they'd march them throughout their territory, showing everyone they were defeated and had no power. That is exactly what Jesus did with Satan and his cohorts. Now, the devil doesn't want you to know that Jesus took away all of his power. So, what did he do? He spends all of his time roaming about like a roaring lion, looking for whom he may devour. That would be those who think he still has power. Now, his bark is the only thing he has. He no longer has a bite. These are the only things Satan can do since then. Number one, he can distract you. He can take your focus off of God and move it over onto the cares of this world. He's a master at it, isn't he? I know you've had that happen. He can deceive you. He's very cunning and sneaky in his deceptions. He's the father of all lies. He's crafty, wily. So be aware of the wiles of the devil. But here's the key. Ready? He always attacks you where you lack knowledge of God's word. Then, just to make sure he contains you as a captive, he liberally sprinkles everything he does with fear. Fear is twisted faith. Remember this, the devil can't create, he can only imitate. So open up your mouth and tell him it's illegal for him to touch you. Tell him you know he has no power because Jesus defeated him at the cross. Tell him you are a citizen of heaven and belong to God. Then, tell your body to line up with God's word. When you get up in the morning, tell your body how it feels. You never, never, never let your body tell you how it feels. Now, you have to understand this. Satan cannot give you sickness and disease. Well, wait a minute. You said earlier that Satan's the one making us sick. That's correct, but Satan can only offer it to you. Satan always works from the outside in, and God always works from the inside out. Now, because Jesus is one flesh with you and the Holy Spirit resides in you, there's no room for the enemy. He can't even get in. So don't take sickness and disease. Well, how do we take it? We say it. We open up our mouths and we say it. Actually, we come into agreement with it. We agree with what the enemy says about us instead of agreeing with what God's word says about us. Now the enemy wants us to, the flesh pushes us to. You want some evidence? Have you ever noticed that when you don't feel well, the first thing you want to do is tell somebody? If you simply must tell someone that there's something wrong, tell them in this way. I'm under attack from the enemy and I'm fighting lying symptoms, but my healing is manifesting. That's the truth. You are under attack, but you're not staking a claim on sickness by speaking it into your body. Jesus laid his life down for us only to take it up again so that we can too. God decreed the length of our lives in Genesis 6, verse 3, where he said that he would, would not contend with man forever, but limit our lifespan to 120 years. My friends, that was out of the mouth of God. Moses was the one who limited our life by speaking 70 to 80 years. He was just a man. Who do you believe? <laughs> Listen, no one can steal your life, my friends. You have to lay it down. Are you ready to do that, or do you still have unfinished business here? It's your choice. Okay, then how do we maintain our healing? Very simply, by giving God thanksgiving. It's that simple. Thank God every time you think of it. Every time the enemy gives you a twinge, thank God for your healing. When you get up in the morning, thank the Lord for healing you. It stirs up the healing power of God in your body, and it goes to work pushing out all sickness and disease, healing you, restoring you in, uh, to divine health and wholeness. Right now, my friends, this may be your time. This may be the moment for you, appointed by God to make a decision for Christ. So, dear ones, if the Lord is speaking to your heart today, if you desire to come into the kingdom of God and dwell in the miraculous presence of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, if you desire to be in Christ, become a child of God, and avail yourself of His healing power and marvelous wisdom, you must give your life to Him. You know what? It's real simple, super simple, and very pain-free. In just a moment, I'm going to give you that opportunity. And humbly left your throne 
To reach someone like me If you had not walked Upon this broken ground Where on earth would I be now If you had not come To know and have a relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, sincerely repent from all of your sins. Repent means change your mind and turn away from all sin. Come before the Lord with a contrite heart, which is a broken, crushed, and crippled heart, and reach out to Jesus. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner and surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me and set me free for all eternity from all my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead and sit at the right hand of God the Father. Take over my life and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I renounce the devil and all sin. Lord, I receive from you the gift of righteousness, total forgiveness of all my sins, past, present, and future, divine health, wholeness, and restoration, your protection, direction, your provision, your peace, and the gift of everlasting life. I'm yours. Come into my heart and take over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you join me in that prayer and you believe what you prayed, 
then you're saved. Hallelujah. Welcome to the family of God. Do you know that all of heaven is rejoicing? Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us. And we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. And so we share. Savior Jesus Christ tore for you. Eat and remember the wounds that heal, the death that brings us life. Paid the price to make us one. the wonderful things that we receive from partaking of Holy Communion at the table of the King of Kings is healing of our bodies and minds. Listen closely. Healing can be yours 
just from taking Holy Communion. However, before taking Holy Communion, we have to prepare. But before we do prepare, I want you to understand something about our use of the elements of the covenant. Jesus and his disciples had bread and wine on the table when they shared the Last Supper. The meal itself had come to an end, and there was still some food left on the table, some bread and wine. Now, these items were familiar to all of them because they had used bread and wine forever to celebrate the Passover. Because those particular items, the bread and wine, were used to draw the picture that Jesus wanted them to see, we use the same items today. However, remember this, it doesn't matter what food items you use. Use what you have available to you. It's perfectly acceptable. Why? Because we pray over the items, sanctifying them as the body and the blood of Christ. This is what I want you to see. What you need to do is believe that they become the body and the blood of Christ. <clears throat> now, the Word of God tells us that the first thing that we must do is discern the body of Christ. What do we do? Well, that means that we acknowledge that the bread or, or whatever food we're using as the body of Christ is the vibrancy of the life of Jesus. His supernatural healing and wholeness, his attributes and perfection are yours. That because his body and, and because of his body and blood, you supernaturally have become bone of Jesus' bone and flesh of his flesh. That you are now filled with his marvelous power, completely healed, completely made whole, completely restored to divine health and wholeness. You could think of it as medicine, a pill. That's, you know, it's glowing with the Shekinah glory of God. Every time you take this medicine, it's healing you as it travels through your mouth and down into your body. And as it goes, it's pushing out all the darkness, all the sickness and disease from the inside out. Now, visualize the condition you're plagued with, that sickness or disease being on Jesus's body. Put whatever the ailments are on him. Use your imagination, my friends. You're not giving him something he doesn't want. He already took it at the cross, remember? The enemy's trying to trick you. He's trying to trick you into taking it. How? By deceiving you into thinking that you've got it through lying symptoms. But since Jesus took it at the cross, you're already healed and made whole. So put that lying symptom back on Jesus in the same place on him that you've been afflicted. In other words, see yourself without the problem. See yourself with the solution. This is called spiritual visualization. It's vital and, and, and that you understand it and do it. Now, my friends, if you have been diagnosed with a problem and you are being treated by a doctor, and then continue your treatment and medications, but add to it your faith and your taking of the healing of uh, uh, a healing power of Holy Communion, because that's yours for healing and re re restoration. Now, remember too that we believe in doctors. Don't just try to believe away your situations by mental assent, coming into alignment with uh, agreement with uh, thinking that that you're you're well and you're not sick. Now, don't kid yourself. If you've got symptoms, you've, you've got something trying to get you. So you've got to turn around and get rid of it. So don't try to do that. Go to the doctor and get a name for what's plaguing you. Why? Because everything with a name has to bow to the name of Jesus. Now, the next thing we do in preparation is discern the blood of Christ. We discern it as the forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future. The restoration of the blessing to your life, the power and the authority of God in your life in full operation as receiving God's provision and protection, as receiving the gift of righteousness from Jesus Christ, thanking God for his plan of redemption, that you have been included in it, that you've been given eternal life, life everlasting, and now you no longer live under the law. You live under his grace. Now lift up the elements of the covenant. These are the items I asked you to assemble at the beginning of the program. Lift them up before the Lord as I pray. Father, we praise you and worship you with these elements of the covenant. We thank you that your only begotten Son, Jesus, gave his life sacrificially so that we may live and have life more abundantly. We thank you now as this food item becomes his, uh, our portion of his healing body and the vibrancy of his life within us. We thank you that as we partake of the body of Christ, we become healed and made whole, completely restored. We thank you that this beverage becomes our portion of his cleansing blood, that we're continually washed in that waterfall of his precious blood and renewed within as we continually remember his act of love on the cross on our behalf. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. The Lord's Supper is a personal fellowship, my friends. It's a partnership with Christ. Partaking of one bread creates partnership between the members, disciples as well, and it merges them into one body known as the church. Now, the Word of God commands us to eat the bread and drink the cup. Continually take the bread and give thanks, break it and eat it, then give, take the cup and, and give thanks and bring, drink it, uh, all in the remembrance of, of Jesus and what he did on the cross for us. The Lord commanded that we do it often. It's supposed to be repeated often. And yet Paul doesn't give us instruction in the Word as to how frequently the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated. 
He does imply it's to be done with frequency, so that partaking of the Lord's Supper will continually recall to our minds our redemption by Christ from all sickness and disease and all sin. My friends, do it as often as you want to and need to. Remember, too, that you don't need a priest, a minister, or a pastor to administer Holy Communion to you. If you're born again, we born-again believers are members of the royal priesthood, and therefore we have been given authority by God, that right by God, to administer Holy Communion to ourselves and others. Now, as we're instructed, we discern the body and the blood of Christ as we prepare to partake. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you that this item of food has become the bread of life and has become the healing body of our Lord Jesus the Christ. The body of our Lord Jesus broken for you so that every cell, every tissue, every organ and bone, all systems, cardiovascular, neurological, blood vascular, lymphatic, muscular, skeletal, all systems are totally aligned with God's word and his will. That you are and remain healed, made whole, and totally restored to the divine health and wholeness of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, our healer, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the body of our Lord and Savior. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you that this beverage has become our portion of the precious saving blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. The blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you in celebration of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, for the remission of all of your sins, past, present, and future, for the restoration of the power, the blessing in your life, and the gift of righteousness, and his protection. In the name of Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the body, I'm, I'm sorry, the blood of our Lord and Savior. You know, my friends, the Lord's Supper is a feast. Mm -hmm. It's a feast in union with the believers and the living Savior, whereby we spiritually and by faith receive Christ with all of his benefits and we're nourished with the vibrancy of his life into eternal life. And for that, my friends, we are eternally grateful. Amen? Okay. We're about to go into the spirit and lay hands on the sick and the suffering and the oppressed for healing and wholeness and restoration. And this is what's going to happen. I'm going to pray over you, and as I do, I'll administer the healing power of God to all of you. Then, I want you to soak in worship, listen to the words of the music, and let the Holy Spirit minister to you as I pray in the Spirit for your healing touch from God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence, for the healing power of God that you have given us as a gift and a weapon in our arsenal to use against the enemy. We thank you that you have given us the power to bind and loose. And Lord, we praise you, worship you, and give you honor as we bind the divine health and wholeness of Jesus the Christ to our listeners. We give you praise as we lay hands on our listeners and administer the healing power of God to their bodies. And we praise you as we see that healing power coursing through their bodies, healing all sickness and disease that would try to come against them from the enemy. We praise you as we bind the, uh, the uh, mind of Christ and the total restoration of mind, body, and soul to all of those who will believe, and we speak their divine healing into their lives and into their bodies in Jesus' name. We bind the enemy and his minions from our listeners and tell the demonic spirits to come out in the name of Jesus the Christ. We lift you up, Lord, and thank you for filling those vacancies with your precious Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for healing all who are sick, oppressed of the devil, and need a healing touch from you. And we give you thanks and praise that we believers are bone of Jesus' bone and flesh of Jesus' flesh. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our healer, the Christ, and call every person within the sound of my voice healed, made whole, completely restored, and walking in your divine health and wholeness. Amen. Healing Flowing down Liquid love Saturate me now Overshadow me Whoa. Touch me with your Overshadow me Whoa. 
Now, just a reminder, when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Bible tells us that we are made a new creation or a new creature in Christ Jesus. So get a hold of this now. We're carried completely ensconced, completely ensconced and surrounded in Christ. We're totally fused together with him. If you could see his DNA, we would be able to look at yours and see his wound up in spirals, in your spirals. Every cell of your body, every cell of anybody who's born again, their bodies includes Jesus's DNA oh. mixed with theirs. Therefore, nothing evil can ever touch us. Sickness, disease, disaster has to get through him in order to touch us, and that, my friends, is impossible. We can't be sick. Oh, sickness and disease can be offered to us. The enemy can try to, to get us to take it. How? By coming into agreement with it. Remember, we're totally protected in Christ. 1 John 4, verse 17 tells us that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Hallelujah, my friends, that belongs to you. Now, remember what I just taught you in this lesson, the way to maintain your healings by giving thanks to God continually. And by that, I mean, when you get up in the morning, first thing, begin your day by thanking God for your healing and restoration and that you are in Christ. Then you can get on with your day as usual. Throughout the day, as you think of it, give God glory for healing you. And again, thank him that you're in Christ. At night before you retire, give God thanks again for the healing power of God that's in your body, coming against all attacks of the devil, keeping you healed and whole and completely restored. Then, be sure to give him thanks and praise that you abide in the secret place of the Most High, in Christ Jesus. Raise your hands for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May you open up your mouth and continually declare the healing that you have received and give thanks to the Lord Most High. May the Lord continually bless you with divine health and wholeness and make your way prosperous as you walk in his love. Now remember, because we are in Christ, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Music